And, hey, did you notice where Pastor Phil preached from last week? Yeah, I just want to point that out to some of you. Okay. No. No, he asked me, so have you been going off the platform? I said, you know what? I've been really working really hard on staying on the platform, and here you come along and get off the platform. So try to do my best. We, we've been working through a series of the church that God blesses. I want to be that church. I don't want to just do things for God's blessings. You ever done something like that? You do something for the reward of it? Well, sometimes we do that. You know, we do that with our children, and I would never apologize for that. In 30 years of ministry, and actually before that, but 30 years of official ministry, of always having children a part of that, I would never apologize for offering them an incentive to learn a scripture or bring their Bible or whatever. Because you know what I'm doing? I'm instilling good habits into their life. It's true. Scripture says you use it like honey. <laughs> you knew what it was talking about. Oh, honey is sweet. It's easy. Oh, it goes down nice. Well, it's the same way. People say, oh, you're bribing kids. No, I'm instilling in kids. It's what you do with it that counts. Oh, and if kids are more faithful to church because they got a piece of candy, I'll take it. If you haven't heard Robbie's testimony, Robbie was a, a kid that wasn't in church, not a part of a church family at all, was out on like a football field or a yard, backyard kind of thing, and this guy comes by and he says, hey, anybody that wants a piece of candy tomorrow, be right here and we're going to have a bus pick you up. That's why she started going to church. Every week, she got a piece of candy for riding the bus. But do you know what happened? She ended up getting saved. She ended up getting filled with the Holy Spirit. She ended up getting called into ministry. That little piece of candy was a pretty good investment in my wife's life. Oh, because it helped instill good things into her heart. So I want God's blessing. And I don't want to just do things because, okay, I'll do this because I, I, I want God to bless me. I think it has to be more than that. Our hearts have to be more sincere than that. That's, that is, that's a way you can do it, but that's a very shallow way to do it. And we don't want to be shallow. We want to do things because it's just the right thing to do. It is obedience to Christ. So as we, we look at this series, and we've looked at that, that if we want to be a church that God blesses, we have to be a church that asks for His power. Ask for His power. Not, notice what I said. I didn't say we ask for His blessing. Oh, the American prayer, God bless me, God bless my family, and we're gone. Everything is about me. So I'm not saying that we, as a church we ask for God's blessing. I'm saying as a church we ask for a genuine outpouring of whatever His presence is in this place. However He wants that to look. Okay? The second thing we looked at is that we want to be a church that proclaims the good news of Jesus to sinners. God has the power to save you and to change you. To change you. God has the power to do that. I don't know about you, I do not have the power to do that for anybody. You don't have the power. You may want to change. You may be sitting next to the person you want to change. <laughs> Never really works that way, does it? It just doesn't. But we need to know that God has the power. And He can save people and change. Whoever is in Christ is what? A new creation or creature. The old is gone and the new has come. Our lives should be different because we've experienced Christ. We want to be the church that proclaims that. God blesses people and churches who proclaim that to this world. The third thing that we looked at 
is that a church that God blesses is a church that utilizes or allows people to move in whatever their giftings are. Whatever you're good at, that's what you should be doing. It's true. Whether it's a spiritual gift listed in the, in the, the nine power gifts of the Spirit, or whether it's a gifting to play the piano or guitar or sing or, or work at the sound booth or shake hands or serve on a board or come and shovel snow. Thank you to people who've been coming and shoveling snow. Oh, those are blessings. You're a ministry. God sees that gift. And that going out and shoveling snow this morning was, a, was the gift we needed this morning. Hey? I saw so many leave Sunday school last week to go do it. Why? Because that was the gift that needed to be used. God can use us in whatever way if we will allow Him to do that. The last time we met before Phil was here, we talked about if we want to be a church that God blesses, we must be a church that is devoted to God's Word. God said it. We believe it. And that's good enough. It's true. God said it. I believe it. See, we got a whole lot more things going on in church world right now. God said it, but I'm not really sure I can count on that anymore. God said it, but it really doesn't come across politically correct anymore. And so people have compromised. God said it, but... No, no, no. God said it, and whether you believe it or not, it's still the truth of God's Word. Oh, so we might as well believe in it. We might as well follow after this thing with everything we got. Well, today I want us to take our attention, and I want us to look at, a, at another area. I want us to look at the area of how we treat one another. Because I believe that a church that God blesses is a church where the people deeply love and care for one another. I apologize that I don't have notes. I know some of you are like scratching things down. Normally I provide that for you. Our copier is down. So I apologize for that. So I, I will, you know, I can catch you all up. So in our text that we've been looking at, in Acts chapter 2, it simply says this, starting in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. There's our word today. Fellowship. That was a part of the DNA of the church. I'm going to read the rest of this little passage just so you kind of see what fellowship looked like then. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Who added to their number? The Lord. People coming and being apart, getting saved, is that not a blessing? It is. And who was doing the blessing? God was. Right? This is a part of the DNA of that first church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Now, that word is actually the word koinonia. That's the Greek word that is used there. And we often, we think of the word fellowship, and really, if you think about it, fellowship is a church word. Take church away from your life, and do you use the word fellowship? Probably not. We fellowship, and it all is connected to 
church. That's where we get that word. It is a church word. But the word koinonia actually means more than FFF or potluck dinner or meet and greet during the service. It actually, listen to these words that describe koinonia. Community, communion, joint participation, sharing, and intimacy. Now when I say communion, I'm not meaning the Lord's Supper. I'm meaning two people have communion, relationship. Okay. Now, to get an idea of, of what this looks like, I want us to look at three challenges that Jesus gave his disciples. My prayer this entire week has been this. That one of these three areas, probably every one of us struggles with. Maybe you struggle with two, maybe you struggle with three. But my prayer has been, Lord, may as we come to this, may we not just hear another sermon, but may your Holy Spirit speak to us that even though these may be challenging and sometimes difficult, may we embrace them and say, Lord, help me to do that. Because it's in your word. Pray that with me. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask for your anointing to be on our ears to hear what your spirit would say to us as individuals and to us as a church body. May you speak as only you can to our hearts, to the innermost thoughts of our being. Challenge us today with the words that you spoke over 2,000 years ago now. Challenge us anew and afresh today. And I thank you for it. In your name I pray. In John chapter 13, this is right before Jesus is getting ready to check out on this earth. This is in uh, the discourse of the, the last night that he's with his disciples. And in that interaction, he gathers them all around. Now we know they're eating the Lord's, they're eating the, the Last Supper. He washes the disciples' feet. All these things are going on. Judas is going to betray him. He's going to go to the garden and, and pray. He's going to get arrested. And then throughout the night, there's going to be three mock trials that finally will decide that he is to be crucified and put to death. All during that time, he's had the crud beat out of him. He has just become a, a mess to the point that when, when uh, he stands before Pontius Pilate and he brings him out to the crowd, he has to say, Behold, the man! Because he's had the crud beat out of him so much, it wasn't even sure, is that the same guy? Well, on that night, before all of that happens, Jesus pulls these guys together and he says, I've got something to tell you that's really important. It's found in John chapter 13. And it says, Let me give you a new command. Love one another. In the same way I loved you, love one another. Now, Jesus in that moment is, is saying a new command. Th these were a people that had lots of commands. They had the Ten Commandments. They've had them for thousands of years as a people, the Jewish people. They've had all of those. Along with them, God gave many, many other laws and things for them to follow throughout the book of Exodus and Leviticus. He gave them lots of different things. But Jesus comes along and he says, Hey, can I have your attention for a moment? I want to give you a new command. I want you to love one another. 
not just don't steal from somebody, not just don't commit adultery with their wife, not just don't bear false witness against them. Okay, all the things, it was all the list of don'ts. But now he's saying, love them. Love one another. In the way I loved you, I want you to love them. Now think of this. Before the cross, that had one meaning. After the cross, that had an incredible meaning. But how had Jesus loved them? They'd been traveling together, some of them, for three and a half years. Living together on the road, basically. Think you get to know somebody in that amount of time? I think of the last trip we took a year ago to uh, El Salvador where we were there for 10 days. And in 10 days, you feel like getting to know these people. You know? You're eating together. You're in the same bedroom. You're, you just, you're all together. You're working together. You're sweating together. You're bleeding together. You're hurting together. You're praying together. And that's kind of what life with Jesus was. It was together. We see times when he rebukes them. We see times when he has to simply uh, explain things to them because they don't understand or get it. But thick and thin, they are together. So in the context it is written, that's what they're hearing. How I've treated you for the last three and a half years, that's how I want you to treat one another. I want you to love them. When Paul comes along, he helps us see a little bit of the practical side of this. In Romans 13, 8, he says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Oh, remember Jesus saying a new command I give you? He was talking about, you know, the references there. I know you have all the old laws, commands, but I'm going to give you a new one. Now Paul comes along and he says, huh, if you love one another, you fulfill the law. You fulfill it. You're bringing it to completion. He says in chapter 12, verse 10, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Now that bring, I think that paints an incredible picture. Outdo one another in doing good, in loving one another, in, in showing honor to one another. I think that's an area where most of us could do better. I, 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 that's something I know I struggle with. We all can do better at showing other people honor, dignity. The most famous passage of Scripture on love is what? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Again, the Apostle Paul. And we talked about this in the last few weeks or whatever, a couple weeks ago. We talked about the gifts. Remember the week we talked about the gifts? And I talked, we talked about Romans chapter, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is on gifts. And 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is on gifts. And chapter 13, right in the middle all about love and basically the whole point of those three chapters is this oh, you can have every gift in the world but if you don't operate in love you got nothing listen to these words and now I show you a more excellent way if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal 
I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. I don't know about you, but that one hurts sometimes. Have you ever been impatient with another human being? Reach over, touch your spouse, say, he's not talking about us. You know, sometimes the most impatient we become is with the people we say we love the most. Love is kind. You don't have to over-exemplify that. You don't have to go to the Greek. You don't have to break that word down. You don't have to say, let's, let's dissect this. What does it really... No, it means be kind. It's a simple little thing, isn't it? To be kind to one another. It does not envy. When somebody else has something good happen to them, ever get envious? Wish I had that. You remember my dad used to say, I wish I had that and they were sitting on a feather. That way we'd both be tickled. Okay? I don't know where he got that, but one of the expressions I remember him saying. Oh. It does not boast. It is not proud. been talking about both of those things in our, in our study on Daniel as we've been looking at the life of King Nebuchadnezzar. A man that before his encounter with God, before he surrendered his life to God, he was an incredibly arrogant man. Well, he was king of the world, why not be that? And God showed him and brought him down seven years he crawled on the ground like an animal, ate grass. You want to think God can't humble somebody? He can, he can do that to the king of the world at that time. It is not rude. Love is not rude. We live in a world that is just plain rude. Well, I'm just telling you the truth. There is truth, and there's a way to speak truth. But speaking truth and being rude is not add up to be success. It's not the right way to do it. It is not self-seeking. We as Americans could spend the rest of the day talking about this. Because we live in a world that for my entire life, advertisers have been saying to me, look out for number one. It's all about you. If it feels good, do it. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It doesn't say you can't get angry. It says you better not be just running around like you're ready to explode on people. That's what easily angered is. Something pops up and just, ah! There's your reaction. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Ugh. Easily angered. That's something that we should be growing out of as we mature in Christ. It keeps no record of wrongs. Some of you need to get out your Bible and you need to cross the circle that, not cross it out. Circle that. Some of you have already crossed it out. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Oh, you may not have a notebook or a journal where you do that, but you have an elaborate filing system. 
And just the mention of that person's name brings it all to the forefront. Well, you don't know what they did. No, but you do. Because it's all right there. Love keeps no record of wrong. You know, that verse really correlates to God who says, I will take your sin and I will bury it in the deepest sea. I will take it so that it is as far as the east is from the west. I will remember it no more. Now, how God does that, I don't know. So when he comes along and inspires Paul to write, love keeps no record of wrong. God understands that. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. Now, I'm going to read that passage in its entirety that I just read through without stopping. And I want you to picture your life in this church. Your life with the relationships you have in this church. And now I show you the most excellent way. If I speak to you in the tongues of men and of angels, excuse me, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. You know, the Apostle John, considered by himself to be the disciple Jesus loved, that he's the one that gave himself the title. He uses it every chance he gets. But he, in his Gospels, he wrote the, the book of John, and then he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And one of those Gospels, tucked away at the end of, of Scripture, is all about love. John was known throughout his life as the disciple of love. At one time, he'd been the son of thunder. <laughs> son of thunder! Yeah! The guy of love. And he had, he had, he had an encounter with Jesus that was transformed was transforming? Absolutely. But he wrote, he, he, his, one of his favorite expressions as he got older was he called people little children. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. That's 1 John 3.18. Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and and truth. You know what he's saying right there? Put your money where your mouth is. Oh, I love people. I love everybody. I'm a Christian and I love, 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 love. He's saying, great. Show me. Well, I am. I love, 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 love everybody. No. Show me. Show me in deed and in truth. Oh, I love that. Deed and in truth. Because sometimes we can do the deed. Oh, I love, I love, I love. And we don't do it in truth. 
our motive is not right in any way, shape, or form. You show me that you love people by your actions, not your mouth. By your actions. Oh yeah, the word's got to be there. But show me by your actions and do it in truth. It's not a facade. It's not just for show. Oh, there we go. You ever seen somebody that does something for show? You know within them they would never have done that, but all of a sudden the spotlight's on them, and they shine. There's no truth in that. He writes over in the next chapter in verse 19, we love because He first loved us. He's speaking of Jesus. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or a sister, is a liar. He's not talking about your family. He's talking about your church family. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, universal, worldwide, could mean your family. You claim you love God, but yet you struggle with hatred towards another person. The word is, you're a liar. I love God. I do. I love God. I just don't love these people. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And He has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. How many know that loving each other sometimes is not easy? In fact, sometimes it's just downright hard. But it is what this Word says we are to do. Are we going to embrace the Word? This is a great place for response. Or do we say, that part makes me uncomfortable. I know it's there, but it's just too hard. Jesus gives us another challenge. The next challenge is to forgive. And I wrote in my notes, forgive more. Jesus said, do not judge. This is Luke 6, 37. I forget you don't have notes today. Luke 6, 37. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Is that pretty good math? You guys good at math? Because this adds up. <laughs> no? Don't want to be judged? Don't judge. Don't want to be condemned? Don't condemn others. You want to be forgiven? Forgive others. That's a great math equation right there. Jesus went on, he makes it even a little more difficult when he says in Matthew 6, 15, but if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. You know, I, know, I have Christian friends that don't believe that scripture. Well, that just can't be what that means. The Bible says that if I confess my sins, He's faithful and just to forgive me, you know, forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So therefore, standing on that verse, God has to forgive me. That makes sense. But you can't just pick out one verse that you like. They all have to go together. It's a book. And they all work together. So you can't just say, okay, God, forgive me, and ignore the part that says, if you don't forgive other people their sins, my Father will not forgive yours. Is that not foreign to the world we live in? 
that's even becoming foreign to many people who say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Jesus complicates it even more. When he says to Peter, Peter has come up to me and uh, up to him and he says, "Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him?" As many as 7 times, because that's what the Old Testament taught. And Jesus says, "I do not say to you 7 times, but 70 times seven times. Jesus, again, changes the parameters. We think we got the rules all figured out. Peter's got it. Lord, i got to forgive seven times, huh? He might have been asking Jesus, hoping Jesus would say, you know, Peter, seven's a lot. Maybe let's move that number down to one. Forgive him once and then turn, you know, turn the cheek. And after that, Jesus doesn't give instructions, you know? Take it, tear into him. And I've heard people say that. I've heard people say that. Well, Jesus says to turn the other cheek. So I did that. But after that, he doesn't give any instructions. Oh, he does. He says to, to keep on forgiving. Oh, and, and if you go back to the, to the Old Testament, it was seven times in a day. So he's basically saying 490 times in one day. It's an exaggeration to prove a point. Jesus isn't giving us a number. He's saying, more times than it will happen, you must forgive. What's the number? One more than you're at right now. <laughs> That's the number. You want to know how many times do I forgive? One more time. And then after that, how many? One more time. It's a number that never stops because it's always one more time that we are instructed to forgive. First Peter, he writes, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love one another earnestly, because love covers a multitude of sins. I need that verse. You need that verse. Paul wrote in Colossians 3.13, Bear with each other and forgive one another. And if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. You ever know? Nowhere in Scripture does it say forgive and forget. It doesn't. I've heard, I've heard people preach on this. He doesn't tell us that we can forgive and forget. He just tells us to forgive. In fact, I wish there were things I could forget. I can't. There are times when people have wronged me, times when they have hurt me, times when they have let me down. And I can't forget. It, it, it's happened. It's in my mind. And sometimes I still remember those things. They come to the forefront. But do you know what I'm instructed to do? Even if I can't forget, forgive. So even if it's still right there, even if it's right there, I have to still forgive. I can forgive that person even though I may not ever be able to forget it. I have the choice there are a lot of people walking over this world that somehow don't believe they have a choice. Well, they hurt me, and I'm going to carry that to my grave. No, you have a choice to either obey Scripture or not. That passage in Scripture in 1 Corinthians, what did it say? It said, love keeps no record of wrong. We keep moving forward. We keep forgiving. And then the last challenge is a challenge to give all. And one more time, Jesus changes the parameters of what their thinking was 
when he said, this goes back to John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. That's the ultimate expression of love. To sac your, sacrifice yourself for someone else. We understand that that will not happen for most of us. We will live our lives and we will not sacrifice our life, push them out of the road and get hit by the truck kind of thing. It, it probably won't happen for us. However, John, the Apostle, Paul, both expand on this a little bit and make it practical. John says in 1 John 3.16, By this we know, excuse me, by this we know love, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. That's the repeat of this. But... If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? You know, we, we can live with that first part when he just kind of repeating what Jesus said. Oh, Lord, you know, I love, I love people. I would sacrifice my... It is so easy to say those words. So John puts a test to it. I'll give you a little test here. You see your friend that's in need? You see how I have blessed you? Take what I have blessed you with and help them. And then my love, God's love will be in you. If you don't, God's love is not there's a litmus test that is happening. Paul wrote in Philippians 2, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In other words, love becomes unselfish. It becomes sacrificial. You begin to think about other people's needs, their interests, just like you think about your own self. Think about your own interests. You become unselfish and willing to share. Even to the point of sacrificing. A challenge to give all. You know, we tend to think that love is just something that happens to us like you know, that's, that's kind of what the world teaches. You, know, you fall in love like you fall into a ditch. You fall out of love like you fall out of a tree. Oh, you just can't help it. I'm, I'm not lying. You've heard people say it too. Oh, I don't know what happened. We just fell in love. And then several years down the road, and sometimes maybe not even that long, we don't know what happened. We just fell out of love. As if we had no choice in the matter. We had no choice going in. We had no choice going out. It's not my fault. It's not my fault I fell in love. It's not my fault I fell out of love. It just happened. We are living in a world that is living that out every day. Every day. We are called to something different than that. Love is a choice. It's a choice that we have. The Bible teaches us that love is something that we can control. God commands us to love one another, to forgive one another. 
to sacrifice for one another. It means that I can will to love you. You ever met an unlovable person and chose to love them anyway? Sometimes you just think, and some of you immediately went to that person in your family. You know, they're always going to be connected to you. They're family. And they're really, really, really hard to love. But you can will to love them. Easy? No. Do it in your own strength? Probably not. And you know, that's the cool thing about Jesus. Jesus is cool. When he asks us to love, or commands us to love, when he commands us to forgive, when he commands us to go that extra mile, to sacrifice for one another, he never expects that we can do that on our own. He knows we need him. There is nothing inside of John Keck that can do that. It's just too hard. I'm too much like everybody else. We're sinful human nature. But he expects us. Oh, I shared that, that verse from 2 Corinthians 5.17 a little bit ago. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You know what happens as we live our life for Christ? It just becomes a way of life. It becomes second nature. You know, when I was a little guy, I got a hand-me-down bike. My, both of my brothers had written it. But one Christmas, it was mine. I remember crashing that bike really bad going down a big hill. Top to bottom, I was road rashed. I was riding down a big hill that was way beyond what a five-year-old, six-year-old should be riding on. Way out of my league. But do you know, as I got older, I kept riding my bike. I got a new bike for my uh, when I was eight. An incredible bike. One of the guys in Macomb uh, took it out of my shed and restored it for me. Beautiful now. Never ride it now. <laughs> it's too, too little. But one day I'll have a grandkid that'll be all over that bike. But you know, riding a bike became second nature for me. Now, I haven't ridden a bike in a long time, but I can get on a bike and go and ride. Probably still ride beyond my ability. <laughs> But in my Christian walk, you know, that when I first got into this, there are things that were really hard for me. For one, I can tell you, I had, I had a lot of anger. And I had that exploding thing going on, where I just, yeah, I would explode. Just don't cross me, all right, explode. Oh, well, I don't have that going on in my life much longer. Oh, well, maybe a little bit. I'm going to lie to you, sometimes that raises its head. But for the most part, not like it was. It's, not, it's never. Even if I have that, it's not like it was. Why? Because the more I'm in this, God continues to change my life till it becomes a new nature. The old is gone and the new has come. And the more I'm in it, the more I find that it's easier to love people even when they're unlovable. The more I find that it's easier to forgive people even when I know that they've really hurt me deep. And it's easier for me to sacrifice what God has blessed me with to bless others. Because I know how blessed I am. Those things when I first got in, really hard to do. But now all these years later, it's like, wow, I'm doing a lot better in that area. I'm doing Things are going better here. Because I'm practicing. I practice love. I practice forgiving. I had somebody call me a couple weeks ago and say, oh, I need to beg for your forgiveness. Like, Why? I said, well, I know that I really hurt you. I said, you didn't. Well, I know that I said this. 
And I said, you did. And you know, and in that moment, I had the thought. I, I don't think that they mean that. And I'm not, I'm not going there. It's a choice that I've made to walk in forgiveness. Oh, even though they've hurt me, I, I, I can't live with that. Oh, and whether they ever come back to me or not, I don't care. I choose in that moment, as quick as I realize it, I have to walk in forgiveness. I just have to. I didn't get there on day one. I didn't get there in year five or ten, probably. But I'm seeing some of that fruit in my life now of what God is doing, just like riding the bike. It just becomes second nature. And all of a sudden, it's easier to love, and it's easier to forgive, and it's easier to sacrifice. Am I there? Huh. Nope. Just ask my wife. Just ask my kids. I'm still not all there. Oh. Just ask some of you. but we're a work in progress. And today, in this place, I believe that God wants to spend a few moments listening to our response of us saying, Lord, I need you, and I need your help. You know, as I prepared for this, and you know, I want to tell you this story of the progression and everything, even though I may not be there at the beginning anymore, and even though I feel like I've made some good strides, in every single area, this week, the Holy Spirit has spoken to me and said, you need my help in that area. You need my help in forgiving. You need my help in being and holding on less to the things of this world and know I blessed you so that you can bless others. I didn't just, not just trying to build your kingdom, boy. I'm blessing you so you can help others. I need help in all of those areas. And today I'm asking if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your life, I'm going to invite you to come and stand or kneel in these altars. And let's just spend a few moments before we leave saying, Lord, I need your help. I need your help. Could you just all stand with me? Elijah's going to lead us in a chorus. And as he does, if you feel directed to come from the Holy Spirit, I pray, come and just stand in these altars.